everybody. My name is Dave Michael, and I'm a science teacher at Red Bluff High School. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the first live, sp live stream, Red Bluff High School, NASA Ames, Lassen Volcanic National Park, Astrobiology Student Intern Public Presentation. Huh. I didn't know if I could get that out. Um, normally, we would be doing this in our PAC on campus at Red Bluff High School. Obviously, this year isn't normal. Um, we are all dealing with challenges, all dealing with stuff that is just beyond our control. Before we get started, all of us really, really, truly hope that you're all safe, you're all healthy, those around you are the same, and you're in a good spot to hopefully enjoy an hour or so of enlightenment from some amazing students that we have here at Red Bluff High School. Since 2008 at Red Bluff High, we've had a program that's partnered with Lassen Volcanic National Park and then also NASA's Ames Research Center. And a lot of times we throw out terms like one of a kind. And when we say one of a kind, we just kind of are oblivious to what that really means. I really want to stress to you that this is a one of a kind partnership between these three agencies. There is no other high school no other NASA facility, no other national park that is involved with research the way that these three agencies are involved here at Red Bluff High School. Tonight, our goal is to share with you a little bit about what it is that we actually do. Um, before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about the impact this program really has on Red Bluff High School. Um, as a partnership, and like I said, it's a one-of-a-kind thing, it is only possible through tremendous cooperation. Now, this cooperation begins with these three agencies, but it extends beyond that into our community as well. Now, what we really do with this program then is we go up to Lassen Park and we don't just learn science. We don't just memorize science. We actually practice science up there. And what I'm referring to is actually the process of science that students for years, whether it goes back in time to the first scientists out there to modern day, students for years have really done. And it's built around the whole idea of observation. And students observe things and people observe things. And from what they observe and when they make these observations, they naturally question what's going on. And after these questions are formed, they then start to come up with a reason, an explanation, a hypothesis for what exactly that, what exactly is going on with that observation. Once they've been able to question that, form that hypothesis, they then experiment and test. And this is done at all levels. We're seeing it right now. Um, at levels in our nation that will hopefully bring us vaccines to tremendous obstacles, challenges, illnesses that are facing us as a society right now. Um, our students are practicing this process right now in the field as high school students. And the reason why this is so unique is that we don't have other high schools that do this. This is it. Like I said before, Red Bluff is you know, tremendous for, tremendously fortunate position to have this partnership while, while they're able to conduct this research. Now, <clears throat> these students, as they are doing this, they are being guided not just by teachers, the leaders at Red Bluff High School, but it also brings in partnerships with these other two agencies. And right now, what I'd like to do is kind of turn it over to them a little bit and explain the impact that this program really has on them and, and, and the role that they play in educating these students as well. And so we have two, actually three total um, individuals that are representing um, our other partners here. First off, I would like um, to introduce education specialist, Ranger Tammy Boyd, and then also Superintendent James Richardson. And these individuals are both, rep are both represent Lassen Volcanic National Park and together they are very instrumental in providing our students the opportunity to conduct this research up there. 
I believe that um, Superintendent Richardson is going to begin and say a few words about the impact that this program has on Lassen Park. Good evening and uh, congratulations to all students. We're very proud of you uh, completing the program and carrying on this great tradition. Uh, this, more than anything else, this is an opportunity for you to learn and practice the scientific method. And we, uh, as um, Mr. Michael has just uh, explained that you need look no farther than uh, the nightly news uh, about uh, vaccines and other information uh, that's going on with the coronavirus to, to know how important science and the scientific method is. Uh, it, it's so applicable to so many things in your life and uh, your future uh, business and jobs. So uh, we are very proud to support that effort and uh, uh, congratulate you on on uh, focusing on science. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Richardson. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dave DeMarais. He He's gonna represent NASA's Ames Research Center. And NASA has a variety of research facilities spread throughout the United States. Ames Research Center is closest to us here in Red Bluff, and they have been very interested in Lassen Park for years, Lassen Volcanic National Park for years. And so I'm just going to hand it over to Dr. DeMarais and let him kind of continue sharing with us the, the uh, involvement of NASA's Ames Research Center. Thank you. Uh, we have entered a golden age of space exploration. Uh, new technologies have created spacecraft that are not only highly capable, that are remarkably resilient and long-lived. And technology has also allowed an engaged public to become more involved in space exploration and the science that it has enabled. But despite these new technologies, distant destinations such as Mars still strongly constrain the capabilities of spacecraft and our communication with them. But still, we have been able to employ strategies that were available long ago to geologists, chemists, and atmospheric scientists, and they were very effective. Those time-honored strategies followed proven principles of field research. First, conduct reconnaissance of the field area to grasp its geographic context and to develop initial impressions about the processes that might have shaped it. Second, visit key locations to make observations and take samples in order to formulate hypotheses about those processes. Then analyze the samples in laboratories and conduct experiments to test the hypotheses. Incorporate all these findings into refined interpretations of the field area. Finally, write reports and make oral presentations to solicit critical reviews by the scientific community. As a result, ask, add to the foundation of scientific knowledge and address any implications the study might have about our world and perhaps also about other worlds. By pursuing the strategy of follow the water, NASA and the European Space Agency have documented evidence of widespread water activity on ancient Mars. But the sheer number of these discoveries presents a new challenge. Which of these promising places most likely hosted ancient life? Given our limited number of visits to the surface of Mars, we must determine which few sites are most promising. And when we visit a promising site, we must know how to look for the crucial evidence. Red Bluff High School, Lassen Volcanic National Park, and NASA Ames Research Center have developed a course where students have pursued those proven strategies of field research that I mentioned earlier. We selected Warner Valley in Lassen Volcanic National Park because it is a modern, ex modern example or analog of certain promising sites on Mars. 
This class has gained many of the perspectives and insights that NASA seeks as we search for evidence of life on Mars and elsewhere. And the achievements by this class are very important because theirs is the generation that will continue the search. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. And we're gonna move on now and, and kind of get to the heart of the reason why that we're, we're all here today. And really that's about the students, that's about these interns. Um, this year there were 18 interns in this course. Four of these interns were in it for a second year. And so that we refer to them simply as second year interns, creative, isn't it? And then the other 14 were, were first year interns. The second year interns were held accountable in a leadership role. They were involved with groups that they led and guided and kind of instructed on how to conduct research and how to analyze the research once it, once it was conducted. And the first year interns were just simply being introduced to the gathering, the observation, the experiment setup, the an analysis of the results of the experiment, just to being introduced to the entire process in general. Now, this year, <clears throat> Well, I'm just going to let them kind of tell you about what they did with the year. And they have put together a presentation for this. Normally, they'd be doing this live in person. Um, due to the events that we're facing, we can't do that, unfortunately, but they have pre-recorded it for you. Um, they have done things with this recording and this presentation that, that I personally <laughs> couldn't do, and I, I greatly respect and, and appreciate their ability to do this. Um, and so I'm just gonna step back now and allow you to kind of follow along and watch, and they're going to explain to you basically what we did over the course of this year. So with that, I think we are ready to go. Hello everyone, my name is TC Drury and I'm a second year intern. I'll be your Master of Ceremonies for tonight. I'd like to welcome you to the 2019-2020 Astrobiology Internship Program presentation. We'd like to thank everyone for watching this virtual presentation as current circumstances do not allow us to present to you in person. In our presentation, we will discuss the work we've been conducting up at Lassen Volcanic National Park this year. To give some context, we'll begin by answering the question, what is astrobiology? We will then consider why we are interested in Lassen and the context of astrobiology, and we'll go over the key requirements for life and how they are found at Lassen Volcanic National Park. Then after going over the main focus of our study, we will review our field trip that we took this year and the field methods, both of which allowed us to carry out this study. We will then examine each of our field sites within Warner Valley, a region in the southeast portion of Lassen Volcanic National Park. This will be followed by a discussion on the lab experiments we conducted based on our field site observations. Finally, we will present our field site interpretations and conclude the presentation by explaining the significance of our study along with the personal impact the program had on all of us students. Katie will now begin by discussing what astrobiology is. Astrobiology is the study of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in the universe. Studying astrobiology includes understanding the origins of life, studying the habitability of other planets, researching extremophiles and their environments on Earth, and searching for life on other planets. Ashmeet will now introduce us to Lassen and its importance to the Mars mission. Lassen Volcanic National Park is a main focus of this program. An important aspect of the park is the hydrothermal system that is found there, which can be compared to similar systems found on Mars and other rocky planets. Microbial life thrives in this environment. Therefore, by researching and experimenting at sites in Lassen Volcanic National Park, we can learn more information about other terrestrial planets and searching for life on them. 
by performing field investigations at Lassen, we can learn what conditions support life and apply the results to similar environments found on other planets and become one step closer to finding life outside of Earth. But it doesn't stop there. We can also learn more about life on early Earth, since hydrothermal systems were a common feature millions of years ago. By researching microbial life on Lassen, we can learn about the early periods of life on Earth. Now that we know that Lassen is the gateway in the search for life, Sahil will explain the specific conditions that are necessary for the habitability of life. To sustain all life as we know it, there are four key requirements which must be met at all times in order to achieve habitability as represented on the right. Primarily, there must be a presence of raw materials. Basic materials for all life are depicted in the Venn diagram. These include carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, key metals, and electrons. Next, for any organism to do work, it requires energy, and this can be obtained from either a chemical or a light source. The conditions of the environment, such as temperature and pH, additionally determine the habitability. Generally, complex organisms require climate conditions. Regardless of the raw materials, energy, or conditions present at the site, in order to support life, an environment requires something that allows all the chemical processes within the organism to occur. This is the solvent. A solvent permits all of the molecules of life to quickly react with one another and form any chemistry an organism needs to survive. For any form of life on Earth, the solvent is water. The four requirements together make an environment habitable. The Venn diagram illustrates this relation with the H in the center symbolizing habitability. Lassen Volcanic National Park was our focus of study because the mountain exhibited a variety of each requirement. Some field sites boasted higher temperatures and lower pH, while others possessed a more neutral pH and lower temperatures. The difference in conditions and raw element abundance made Warner Valley a particular point of interest, and thus it was selected for our research. Next, first year intern Rhys Gambetta will talk about our field trip to Warner Valley. Our field trip took place on September 19th through the 20th. We left for Warner Valley in vans in the morning of the 19th. After arriving at the campsite, we hiked up the valley, taking observations of each field site as we went. After hiking to each field site, we set up our tents and ate dinner. After dinner, we watched a astrobiology presentation. The next day, we broke into groups and hiked back to our designated field sites to collect microbe and water samples. We then packed up our belongings and returned back to the high school. Andrea will now talk about the field methods we used during this field trip. As we sampled in Warner Valley, an important and heavily used method was the measurement of pH and cognitivity. What is pH? pH is a scale that measures from 0 to 14, measuring the acidity and alkalinity of a solution. If a pH is below 7, then it is an acid, meaning it has more hydrogen ions in solution, like stomach acid. If the pH is above 7, it's basic, like bleach, with few hydrogen ions. What is connectivity? Connectivity can be defined as the total dissolved solutes in a solution. The higher the connectivity, the more solutes dissolved. Connectivity is measured in a unit called microsiemens, the measurement of electrical conductance of a substance. And both meters temperatures use the Celsius scale, which is based on zero degrees Celsius for the freezing point of water and 100 degrees Celsius for the boiling point of water. We also used numerous methods for sampling such as falcon tubes, forceps, and pipettes to collect water samples and microbial samples based on each group's field sites. Now that we have established why Lassen Volcanic National Park is important to the study of life and how we made our initial observations, we can consider the sites studied within Warner Valley. As the hill said, water is a key requirement for life and in scientists' search for life, they follow the water. Similarly, we will follow the water in Warner Valley. We took samples and observations from four major springs or streams, which each had very different conditions. Frasia, Alyssa, Dean, and Emma will now speak a bit about our initial observations at each of these different sites. 
The first site we will be discussing in depth is Paddlewell Creek. The Paddlewell Creek site is a freshwater mountain stream located in a clearing at Warner Valley. Visually, there were shrubs surrounding the bank and green grass that grew right up to the edge as well as under the water itself. There were also various species of trees growing around the water. In the water, there was moss and algae growing on the rocks. The water has an ideal temperature and pH, which creates habitable conditions for plants and microbial life to grow and thrive. The conductivity of this site is the lowest of all of the sites because it is fresh water. Another of the sites we looked at was Devil's Kitchen. Devil's Kitchen is located the furthest from the campsite. At this site, there was little plant life surrounding the water and there was visible steam coming from the water as well as a strong smell of sulfur. In the water, there were green and brown microbial mats located near the outflow channel. The water had the lowest pH of all the sites and the highest conductivity of them all. These conditions created extreme living conditions for the microbes. The mainstream site is a large creek that runs through all of Warner Valley, interacting with two of the other sites. The conditions of the water allow various algae, grasses, and other aquatic plants to grow in the creek, as well as trees and grasses along the banks. Because of the site-to-site -site interactions, two sample sites were necessary. Compared to the Paddlewheel Creek, the first displayed a raising conductivity and a slight decrease in pH from interaction with Devil's Kitchen, and the second showed a lower conductivity and a higher pH compared to the first as the Paddlewheel Creek flows into mainstream as a tributary. My field site, Alkaline Springs, was the first site along the path at Warner Valley. It is a small open stream with little vegetation. There were small grasses up to the water's edge, but none within the water. There is a visible steam coming from the water's surface. Even though the temperature of Alkaline Springs is high, microbial features are evident, such as long green filaments and algae. The temperature of Alkaline Springs was 64 degrees Celsius, 147 degrees Fahrenheit. The pH started at 6.7 at the vent of the stream and began to increase to 7.8 downstream, which is a neutral pH. The conductivity was 700 microsiemens, which was the second highest of all the field sites. With these observations from the field sites in Warner Valley, we developed several hypotheses to explain the differences in water chemistry conditions and forms of life we saw at each of the field sites. These hypotheses were tested in the rock dissolution experiment and biological experiments. Fletcher, Braden, and Dean will now provide more details for these. The rock dissolution experiments were made to simulate each of the field sites so that the lab results would allow us to interpret the water chemistry. Throughout the experiments, we maintained different pHs and temperatures depending on what field site we were trying to simulate every week by titrating our solutions back down to their desired pHs. We used the pH values 5.5 and 2, as well as the temperature values of 20 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius for our experiments. We used basaltic rock powder in the rock dissolution experiments because this rock is found throughout Warner Valley. The water interacted with the rock powder to dissolve the elements within the basalt rock into solution. Overall, these experiments evaluated the effects of temperature and pH. Now, Grace will discuss the effects of rocks on the pH of a solution. Our first hypothesis was that interactions between rocks and water increased the pH of the solutions in the laboratory dissolution experiment. Each week, when we measured the pH values of each experiment, we saw that the pHs had risen regardless of the experiment's conditions. In order to maintain the proper pHs of the experiments, we had to add acid to lower the pHs back to their desired values. The graph on the left shows the amount of acid that was added to the experiments whose pH was set at 5.5. The graph on the right displays the amount of acid added to the experiments whose pH was set at 2. Both graphs show that as the days went on, we continued to add acid to every experiment due to the fact that interactions between the water and the rock caused an increase in the solution's pHs. 
Braden will now explain why we had to add more acid to some experiments than others. One of the reasons as to why we conducted the rock dissolution experiments was to determine whether or not solutions with a lower pH and higher temperature are more effective at interacting with rocks and releasing their elements into solution. In the bottom left graph, the effect of pH on the dissolution of rock is shown. In the graph, the bars with matching colors were experiments that were conducted at the same temperature but different pH and therefore show that a lower pH has a greater effect on the dissolution of rock in the sense that each of the experiments with a lower pH had a greater net conductivity than the experiments that were conducted at a neutral pH. Furthermore, in the bottom right graph, which displays the effect of temperature on the dissolution of rock, the bars matching in color were, represent experiments that were conducted at the same pH but different temperatures, and therefore show that a higher temperature has a greater effect on the dissolution of rock, considering the fact that each of the groups with a higher temperature had a higher net conductivity than the experiments that were conducted at a similar pH but different temperature. Fletcher will now talk about the biological experiments that were conducted with the microbes gathered from Warner Valley. At Warner Valley, we took microbe samples and placed them in Winogradsky columns in order to observe them. In these columns, we replicated the conditions that the microbes were living in at Warner Valley. After a few weeks, we then changed one of the microbes replicated environmental conditions to observe some kind of change in the abundance of biomass and diversity. These changes involve the organism being blocked from or left in light temperature or pH being increased or decreased, or solute concentration being changed. Our class hypothesis was, if the environmental conditions of the microbes are changed, then they will undergo a change in growth or appearance. These changes could have taken place in a variety of different ways, such as growth, color, and size. In our experiments, we visually observed and took notes on the changes that took place from week to week in our microbes. At the end of this process, we took a sample of our microbes to be observed through a microscope. This way, we could see the increase or decrease in growth at a more in-depth level. The light or dark variable was altered by covering our Winogradsky columns in black electrical tape or was left unchanged and clear. This way, our microbes either had a normal inflow of light, just like they did at their field sites, or they were completely isolated from light. The temperatures of the microbes were altered by removing the Winogradsky columns from or putting them into an incubator set at 60 degrees Celsius. When altering temperature for an organism, it can have different effects on the organism depending on its optimal temperature. The microbe could either have a boost in the amount of biological processes that it goes through, or it can be negatively affected since it may be past the organism's optimal temperature, which can be seen in the experimental columns of altered temperature. Now, Dean will discuss the effects of pH and solute concentration. The pH of the microbe columns was changed through titration or dilution, maintaining the other water conditions besides the pH, as shown in the green growth in the upper right, which experienced a drop in pH, having a negative impact on further growth. The solute of the water in the experiment columns was changed by using water from a different field site with similar conditions to the microbe's original site, visible in the colony in the lower right, that experienced an increase in growth due to the higher solute count of the mainstream water. In changing the column environments, there was a noticeable effect. After analyzing the results from our experiments, we could relate what our hypothesis proved in the lab back to what we originally observed in Warner Valley. In the lab, our proven hypotheses showed us relationships between pH, temperature, and the solute concentration of solutions. Understanding these helped us to understand the multiple paths of the water flowing through Warner Valley. Now Alana, Reese, Sam, and Mary will describe our interpretations of the field sites after considering our observations and the results of our experiments.
The main source of water for each site is precipitation. The cloud graphic indicates where rain and snow fall the most and then travel down the path through Warner Valley. The site's water stories tell the path the water takes from the moment it falls from the sky to the ground and eventually ends up at one of the field sites. These water stories give each site unique characteristics, such as having a high pH or high temperature, for example. Once again, the main source is precipitation as well as runoff water and groundwater. Padaloo Creek had a low temperature and neutral pH. These conditions resulted in this site having the lowest conductivity value. Despite the fact that rain's pH is around 5.5, once it comes into contact with the ground, we begin to see changes and the pH increases to a value of 7 because of these interactions with the rocks, as consistent with our lab experience. Water found at Devil's Kitchen is supplied by snowmelt and rainfall. This snowmelt and rainfall water seeps into the ground until it comes into contact with volcanic gases and heat. After being heated, the water begins to rise up to the surface. As it rises, the water condenses and surfaces at Devil's Kitchen. The interaction with volcanic gases and heat gives the water its low pH and high temperature. This also makes it more efficient at dissolving rock, which explains the water's high conductivity. Sam will now explain Mainstream's water story. The water at the mainstream site comes from snowfall, rainfall, and groundwater that feeds the largest stream running in the length of Warner Valley. We sample both ends of the stream in an effort to record any changes that may affect the water as it passes through the valley. Mainstream was discovered to have a very similar pH temperature and conductivity to Padawal Creek, with only a few minor differences. Near Devil's Kitchen, we observed an outflow of water from Devil's Kitchen into mainstream. This addition to, of Devil's Kitchen water can explain the lower pH and higher conductivity that was recorded at Devil's Kitchen, Devil's Kitchen's mainstream site. As mainstream runs the length of Warner Valley, it interacts with the rock and also receives an inflow of water from Padawal Creek. As we saw in our lab experiment, the interaction with rocks will cause the pH to rise over time in addition of the Padawal Creek water will further dilute mainstream causing the rise in the pH and the lowering of conductivity that we saw when sampling at the Warner Valley campground mainstream site. Auckland Stream comes from a similar source as Devil's Kitchen. It too originated from runoff that seeped deep underground and interacted extensively with volcanic gases. The heat from deep inside the earth drove it back to the surface, giving it the high temperature we see above ground. However, unlike Devil's Kitchen, the stream is located on a fault line, which allows the water to have more opportunity to be neutralized by the rock around it by taking a less direct and thus longer path to the surface. This results in a more neutral pH at the head of the stream located directly next to the fault line. Because the Auckland stream originally had high amounts of sulfuric acid in its water and had a lot of contact with rocks before reaching the surface, it has a high conductivity. However, once again, unlike Devil's Kitchen, there is not a constant resupply of sulfuric acid which leaves the pH at a much more neutral level. In addition to our interpretations of the water stories, we've formed interpretations regarding the types of life found at Warner Valley. Our Winogrodsky columns showed us the effects of pH, temperature, solute concentrations, and light on microbial life. Now, Frasia, Lachlan, and Tara will talk about the conclusions we formed based on our microbial incubations. The water at both the Padawal Creek and mainstream sites has an ideal temperature and pH, which creates habitable conditions for life to grow and thrive. The favorable conditions enabled the abundance and diversity of the microbial growth present at both sites. The microbial communities that were visually obvious in and adjacent to the water at Padawal Creek and mainstream were different green, brown, purple, and red algae, as well as moss and mats. In relation to our Winogrodsky experiments, the microbes present at these two field sites survive best in their own conditions rather than when their environments were altered significantly. This is because the conditions at these field sites were favorable. These biology interpretations are consistent with what our lab experiments showed. The alkaline site had water that had a higher temperature and more neutral pH, and these slightly harsh conditions led to less diversity than what is seen at the paddle wheel or mainstream sites. 
The microbes we saw were green and brown mat-like microbes along with green, stringy, algae-like microbes. When we altered the environment they were in in our laboratory experiments, we saw that they survived better when in their original environment. This shows that they are specifically adapted to their environment and explains why we don't see the same microbes at the other field sites. At Devil's Kitchen, we observed a high temperature, low pH, and a high conductivity. There were a few trees that were spread around, but nothing too close to the site. When you looked closer at the water, you could start to see lots of different microbial communities. There were green and coral colored microbial communities that were sitting right on top of the clay. You can kind of see from the picture, the outline of the green microbial communities, the coral ones are a little bit harder to see. Also, there were stringy looking microbes that were clinging onto rocks and sticks that had fallen into the water. These microbes were very well suited for their life at Devil's Kitchen and did not respond well to an environmental change. This we could see from our Winogrosky experiments. Now that we have an understanding of our findings in Warner Valley, I'll discuss the significance of our research with the Mars Exploration Mission. NASA's main goal with the Mars Exploration Project is to find evidence of habitable environments and life on Mars. There have been several expeditions to Mars with rovers. The latest expedition, Perseverance, will launch in mid-July of this year. Each rover has given a depiction of the ancient environment of Mars, beginning with the Viking mission in 1976. We have found hydrothermal features with Spirit Rover, ancient stream channels and lake beds with Curiosity, and rocks with elements necessary for sustaining life from all of the landing sites. Warner Valley has a similar landscape to Mars, which allows us to study a terrain akin to what early Mars looked like. With this, NASA is able to design more effective missions that find more supporting evidence of life on Mars. Again, my name is TC Drury and I'm a second year intern. I'd like to thank you all for watching tonight's presentation and for giving your support to the program. To conclude our presentation, each of us will now share the personal impact of the program. For me, the biggest impact of the program was that it allowed me to apply my leadership skills in science and gave me the opportunity to utilize my knowledge of technology to better our research. My name is Ashby Carr and I'm a second year intern in this program. Through this class, I've learned helpful leadership skills and gained scientific knowledge that I can apply in future endeavors, including college classes and my intended career. Hi, my name is Sahil Singh and I'm a second year intern. Through this program, I was able to apply my knowledge into real scientific research and I was able to strengthen my leadership skills working with the first year interns. Hi, I'm Katie Luso, um, and this program has given me the opportunity to experience science beyond a textbook and has given me a greater interest in a career that studies our outside world. This program opened my eyes to the many possibilities and roles available in the scientific field, as well as the unique experience that will affect my decisions in the future. My name is Fletcher Botke, and I am a first-year intern in the NASA Internship Program. This program has shown me what the scientific process is like in a real-world scenario compared to another classroom science lab. I'm Mary Cottier, and I've been influenced by this program by being able to learn how science is applicable in the real world and by gaining a better understanding of how the scientific process works through hands-on experiences. Hi, my name is Lachlan Dean, and I'm a first year intern. This program helped me gain experience in what running an experiment outside the classroom is like, and also taught me new skills and processes needed when conducting an experiment. My name is Fraser Galos, and this program gave me the opportunity to be around other people who truly appreciate science.
My name is Grace Gallagher, and this program has allowed me to learn how to use scientific equipment, conduct my own experiment, and analyze the results of my experiment. These experiences bettered my understanding of the science world. Hi, my name is Reese Gambetta, and this NASA program has impacted the way I look at science. It's given me an opportunity to go out in the field and experience field science firsthand, but it's also given me an opportunity to form a hypothesis, coming up with an experiment, and taking those results and creating a reasonable conclusion with it, and just getting a better grasp of the scientific method overall. Hi, my name is Alana Garrity and I'm a junior at Red Bluff High School involved in the NASA program. Being a part of this program further fueled my love for science and gave me a passion for asking questions and doing experiments to try and find answers to these questions. Hi, my name is Emma Hale and this year's NASA internship has allowed me to get a hands-on experience and it has taught me that it's the smallest things in science that can amaze you. Hi, my name is Alyssa Harrison, and through this program, I was able to gain a better understanding about what science really is, and this deepened my interest in the subject. My name is Braden Klein, and this program has impacted me by allowing me to grasp a better understanding of the scientific process and how it is used in self-designed and self-conducted experiments. Hi, my name is Andrea Marquez and I just wanted to say that the impact that the program had on me is that it allowed me to be able to question things that people normally don't question and allowed me to be able to test and come up with the reasonable explanations that come with trial and error. My name is Tara Norton. I am a first year intern at the NASA Astrobiology Internship Program. In this program, I learned how to perfectly create experiments that will test my hypotheses. My name is Samantha Paul, and this program allowed me to build up my team working skills in the field and also allowed me to make a whole bunch of friends I did not have before. Well, what'd you all think? Now, here's the problem. In order for you to answer that question, you need to be able to know how to do that. And that's where I messed up. What I was supposed to tell you before we started is that we have a place for you to ask questions. And so within the live stream, there's a chat box there. If you go and find that chat box, if you have any questions for any of us, please enter them into that chat box. Um, when I say any of us, I mean the adults or all of these interns that are here with us today. We have first year interns. We have second year interns. Um, you can call them out by name. They'd be more than happy to answer your questions individually. They are ready for whatever you throw at them. And so as you are preparing these questions, getting them going, just a couple more things about this program that I'd just like to pass on to you. This public presentation that you just saw is not the only thing that these students do all year. Um, the majority of the year is actually focused on a research paper. And this research paper is a college level thesis paper that the students produce. Um, they produce this under the guidance of myself, the NASA scientists, the Lassen Park Rangers. Um, together we guide these students and by the end of this, this class, they produced a, a paper it's usually somewhere between 30, 35 pages long, and it's equivalent to what's going to be created by any college level student in a science class. Um, the depth that, it, they, that they go to to write it, um, to get it edited, to finalize it is amazing. And so um, if you get a chance, if you know any of these interns, ask to see this paper from them. It is truly something that they're proud of and they'd love to share with you. Um, besides that, the presentation that you just saw. Um, this year, we did not start the presentation until after the closure of the school on March the 13th. So as you can imagine, there were some challenges involved with it. Um, what you just saw there took countless hours of our students' work on their own 
um, guiding them through Zoom sessions or just emails and just having these students kind of figure things out on their own. So they did an amazing job here of basically coming up with this. And I hope that you agree with me when you when you watch this and you were truly imp as impressed with it as I was. Um, one more that I want to get to, and then we'll get to all your questions. Um, it's just thanking people involved with this. Um, there's so many different levels to this program, so many different individuals involved. Um, first off, I want to start with Red Bluff High School. Um, from our district office to our site leadership here at the school, all the way down to the individual teachers, um, we are supported in so many different ways. Um, personally, I know that this program would not work without the support of all the science teachers within my department. Um, without them involved, without them backing us, we simply couldn't do what we do. So that's really, really appreciated. When you see something like this that the students are producing, we're only able to do this with the support of everyone involved with us here at Red Bluff High School. Now, it's not just, when I, we talk about Red Bluff, it's not just the high school because I know that these students are receiving all kinds of support from parents, from family members, from friends in the community as well. And so all of Red Bluff should be proud of this program. Um, at the school, to the community, everyone that's involved with it. Um, I just couldn't be happier with, with the support that we received from them. In addition to Red Bluff High School, obviously we have partnered with these two amazing agencies. Um, the scientists that we work with closely at NASA um, Ames Research Center, Mike Kubo, Dave DeMarais, Nikki Parentau. Um, these three scientists become as much mentors for our students as they are teachers. Um, they advise these students. They help them get into college as far as letters of recommendation go, as far as getting them scholarships and getting college, college paid for with, um, again, letters of recommendation. And so the assistance and the guidance of these NASA scientists is truly amazing. And that can also be said then of our NASA Volcanic National Park Rangers as well. Um, the support, the guidance, the field work that we get, the practical application and the time that we get with these, uh, with these park rangers up at Lassen Volcanic National Park, it's truly amazing. And it's, um, it's impactful on our students in so many different ways. And so I'd just like to thank everyone involved with this program in the community and the School of Red Bluff um, with NASA at Ames Research Center and, and beyond that. And then also with Lassen Volcanic National Park and the entire park service. It's really been, um, been wonderful working with all these people. So with that being said, I'm hoping I've given you enough time to type out some questions. Do we have any? Okay, so we do have some questions. We'll give people some more time to write those in. Uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll read out some shout outs. Um, so uh, Aaron Michael says, it's so great that the students still get to participate and share all their hard, hard work. Great job to everyone. Uh, Fred Null Jr., congratulations, students. Great contributions to the scientific community. Um, uh, Sandy Dueck, uh, amazing presentations. Uh, you've done NASA and RBHS. Very proud. Congratulations. Hi, Sandy. Uh, Tammy Cooper says, shout out to Mr. Michael. Great teachers create great experiences for students. Um, and now we got some questions. So first uh, from Sandy Duick, uh, besides sulfur, what other sources of ions are there in the surrounding environment of Warner Valley? Hmm, who would like to go on that? How about a second year intern? Let's throw it at them first. And there's no pressure at all. It's not like people are watching you. It's not like you have NASA scientists looking over your shoulders or anything to correct you. If you don't, well, wait, we will know, right? We're not going to get this one wrong. So who's going to go? TC, Katie, Sahil, Ashmi. Don't all go at once. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, they're asking about the other sources of ions in the surrounding environment of Warner Valley, besides sulfur. And I'm used to this. This is, you know, I haven't done this in about two months now because I haven't been in a classroom gym. I'm used to just the awkward silence of waiting. I'm okay with it. 
I like your loved ones are watching you right now that are sitting there going, oh, my kid is getting called out. <laughs> if any students are watching just the live stream, feel free to pop your answer in the chat if you want to uh, answer that way as well. Okay, we're, I guess we're way too shy. Um, Dave or, or Mike or Nikki, do you want to help them out at all? This is water chemistry, Mike. Why don't you do it? <laughs> yeah. Well, hold on. I think I think I heard a, one of the students start to answer. Okay. So let's pause for a second. Ask me. Did you did you have something you uh, you wanted to add? Oh sure. <laughs> um, so sulfur is one of the anions found at Warner Valley. We also looked into cations. Um, some examples are iron, aluminum, sodium. And we analyzed those as well in our results. And where'd they come from? They came from the rocks also. So from rock to solution. Thank you. There's the answer. Nice. Nice. All right. Nicely done. Uh, next question comes from Fennell Jr. Uh, he says, my daughter wants to know, is Lassen Volcanic National Park the only place where this kind of science is happening? Uh, that's sort of a question to a teacher in a way, but I don't know who. Oh. Or, or maybe Nikki. I don't know. Or maybe Nikki. Oh, I think we have a, a scientist with us that maybe does this research in another park as well as Latin Volcanic National Park. Is that true? That is true. Um, certainly, we there, there are quite a few different studies that take place in hydrothermal areas like Yellowstone National Park. Um, we use them as analogs for different environments on other planetary bodies. But as Mr. Michael said earlier, what's unique about this program, it is, it's the only astrobiology internship program within the National Park Service. And it's also a, a unique program uh, within certainly NASA Ames as well. So this, this partnership between the three agencies carrying out research within Lassen Volcanic National Park is completely unique. All right, thank you, Nikki. Our next question comes from Colin Igarta. Out of all the national parks and landmarks in the United States, what makes NASA choose Lassen as the park to compare to Mars biology and environment? All right, Nikki, you did it. And uh, now it's my turn. Uh, I've done research in several national parks, uh, but the one thing about Lassen that is uh, so nice is that, first of all, just plain proximity to uh, population centers where we could really can engage uh, high school students in a sort of real immersion hand-on experience uh, in a national park. And so the fact that NASA Ames Research Center is in California and, and that Red Bluff is so close to Lassen really set up an ideal geography to pursue this course. Uh, I mean, in principle, uh, Yellowstone National Park would be another great place. Uh, you know, it's got the kinds of features also that we see on Mars, that, like what attracted us to Lassen, uh, the evidence of volcanic activity, which we now see happened on Mars. We've now found evidence of hot springs that once existed on Mars. And so in many ways, Lassen is a great match. But really, any national park that embodies some of these features, like hydrothermal activity, hot springs, and so forth, as well as the other environments where water can support life, I mean, they would be uh, eligible also as, as good, good candidate sites. But again, it's that proximity of Lassen uh, to Red Bluff, with a high school that was willing to do this, and also the wonderful cooperation we've had with the Lassen Park staff uh, really made Lassen a, cho a choice place to to launch this course. Okay, thank you, Dave. Let's see, uh, some more shout outs. This is wonderful, very professional, wow. Great experience for kids. Thank you, everybody. Um, the next question comes from Chris DeTeo. Do you think the stream flow rate might be important? And if so, is this something that was or can be tested with the laboratory equipment? Uh, okay, is that with respect to biology? I'm assuming that it might be, in which case, Nikki, do you want to give a try at this? Or Oh, I'm sorry, these are for students. <laughs> Back to the students. Mr. Michael, how do you want to manage this one? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's see. I'll give just 
you know, maybe two or three or five seconds and see if any student wants to try to tackle this. This is something that I know we have not discussed at all. And so I'm kind of curious to, to hear what they come up with on this. And so, um, interns, is there anyone that would like to give this one a go? Mr. Michael, could I uh, say something about that? Yes. Um, in our class, we focused on a very still water. We just had a small column in our experiments. However, um, when we visited the NASA Ames Research Center in the past, I know Nikki um, has set up uh, ways to test that theory of flow rates as they had um, different circulating water systems uh, for different microbial events. Uh, but for this class, we do not test that theory. And, and just so the audience knows, I mean, one of the beautiful things about this program, besides the partnership and the experience the kids are getting, is the evolution of it. And what I mean by that is that we are constantly changing this program and constantly looking to further our understanding of the park and of what we find up there, the microbes, the rocks, everything. And so um, that could very well be a direction that this program takes here in the next couple of years. We could start looking at things like flow rate and, and stuff like that and just seeing how that impacts it. So, Nikki, do you have a quick comment or two about just the effect of flowing water? Or um Sure, if you want me to jump in. Um, so, yes, flowing water can be a very important variable. It affects nutrient delivery to the microbes. Um, and also in terms of flowing water, you know, I don't know if, if Chris, you were getting at it from this perspective, but, you know, might it also af affect the erosion of the rock to release elements into solution as well? Um, but yes, it can have an impact on the microbes, not just from nutrient delivery, but it can also kind of help um, shape how the microbes grow. You heard mention in the presentation of these sort of streamer-like fabrics in the flow. That's something that's a consequence of the hydrodynamics of water flow. Great. Okay, our next question comes from Linda Yanka. Uh, did you see a difference between the microscopic examinations of your sites? And again, let's try to start with the the interns. Is there any intern that would would be interested in answering that question? So, microscopically, were our sites different? Um, and then Nikki, I, I don't want to throw, throw it to you, but I kind of am, I guess. Um, is there, <laughs> could, could you offer some insights to that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So in the presentation, <clears throat> you heard the students talk about, um, the, the, uh, what we call the abundance and diversity of microbes at the different field sites and in their experimental setup in the lab and in what we call these Winogradsky columns. So they did do, they took samples of their Winogradsky columns. They looked at them under the microscope. And what they were doing is they were looking at, you know, was there a lot of biomass? Was the growth really robust and abundant? And also the diversity, how many different types of cells did they see? And they saw very distinct differences between the different field sites. So as you heard the students say at the more neutral pH and lower temperature sites, they saw the greatest amount of diversity, the most amount of different types of cells and the greatest amount of biomass because those conditions were pretty favorable, favorable for growth. As you went to the more extreme sites like the alkaline site or Devil's Kitchen, the abundance and the diversity tended to decrease a little bit because those are fairly challenging conditions to grow in. And so the students did see discrete differences in, in the microscopy. And I'm sure that um, had they had the chance, they would have presented some images of that. I just want to say that last year or the year before, they actually had the uh, audacity or the... Uh, or, uh, the or, um, insight to actually stick their smartphones right up to the uh, eyelet eyepiece of the microscope and i thought this isn't going to work and they just got wonderful images <laughs> that's something i never would have attempted and this is why you get young people involved in science <laughs> they get outside the box and do things we wouldn't have dreamed about 
but yeah, the guy got some great pictures um, using that method. All right, fantastic. Um, next question is from Trevor Breckenridge. He asks, where can the students go from this program? Well, it, it really depends on the student. Um, you know, the second year interns are, are seniors and they're, they're branching out. They're, they'll be leaving us here in a couple months and, and going off to school. Um, and it's wide range. Um, in the past, we've had students, you know, leave this program and go as far away as um, Notre Dame. Um, you know, there's they're just spread out across the country, really, as far as colleges go. Um, I'm still waiting for the uh, the invite to, you know, an ex interns like PhD, you know, or Nobel Prize ceremony or something like that. It that hasn't quite happened yet, but but I'm hopeful that these four that are leaving us now, you know, not to put pressure on, and I'll again call you guys out, TC and Ashmi. Katie and Sahil, not to put pressure on you, but but I will expect a, a front row seat at your Nobel Prize <laughs> ceremony when you get something. Okay, um, but really the uh, the opportunities are endless when um, when we look at the fact that this is a unique program. Um, it has carried some weight and allowed students to go out and experience things um, in a wide range of places and. And it's really just up to them as far as where they want to go and what they want to do when they get there. I'd like to add something to that. It's a lot of these students come in with sort of an interest in science and technology. But, you know, these are broad fields. And I think one of the things I've noticed over the years is it allows them to identify which and areas of science or which aspects of and technology uh, really sort of interest them. And, and sometimes it's hard for a student to, to take that step unless they experience sort of hands-on immersion experience of things. And so... Uh, we'd like to think that this course, amongst other experiences it'll have, will just help really make the connection between uh, an interest and a profession. Yeah, I was just going to kind of follow that up. Uh, in terms of other opportunities that are out there, NASA has other internship opportunities for undergraduates and graduate students and, and even beyond that. And there's a website that I can try to put in the chat um, window for other internship opportunities. So there's an opportunity again for sustained exposure and mentoring to uh, different NASA science and engineering programs. Yeah, just a final comment. I found that the, the sooner students can get involved in a research experience or a hands-on experience like this, the more assertive and, and proactive they are about taking the next steps in their career. Uh, you know, they've already been through a challenge sort of professional experience and it really gives them a more generally more self-confidence in, in making key decisions down the road and the whole importance of being able to engage in critical thinking. All right. A lot of good advice in there. Trevor uh, follows that up with a comment. Great presentation, by the way. Wonderful information and production value. Thank you, Trevor. Um, next question is from Fred Knoll Jr. Are there any seasonal changes in the microbial life? Um, summer compared to winter, for example. I don't know if students are prepared to answer that one because we did one field trip in September. <laughs> but uh, I'll be quiet and see if somebody responds. I know that um, uh, Dave had talked about that um, in different seasons, um, the water of the sites or water can change slightly in temperature. Um, I'm not quite sure about anything else, but I do know that temperature can have a huge effect on um, microbes. Um, so I, I think that there is probably a, a change in um, abundance and maybe diversity as well um, with, with each season. So yeah. Nikki, you got to follow up on that. Oh, I thought that was a great answer. Um, and, you know, the students were at a disadvantage this year because just as we were going to do our 
winter slash spring snowshoeing trip to sample up at Sulphur Works. Uh, everything was shut down due to COVID-19. So the students didn't have an opportunity to observe that this year. But um, yes, there can be changes in temperature across the seasons, but also there can be a change in light intensity. So during the winter months, as we all know, things get a little bit darker, the sun angle is a little bit lower. That can impact some of these photosynthetic microbes, and we can actually see quite a significant decrease in growth across the season. Reasons. But Katie gave a great answer. Yeah, it's great. Okay, and there's the mute button. Okay, moving along. Uh, our next question comes from Tim Drury. He asks, have any discoveries from the rovers on Mars made you want to take a closer look at specific sites data in Warner Valley? How are findings in both areas possibly similar? Well, when we first selected Lassen and Warner Valley, we were really focusing in on the hot springs um, because the discoveries made by the um, Spirit rover said, wow, you know, we're finding these uh, fossil equivalents of these sites on Mars. And so wouldn't it be great to, uh, you know, pick Warner Valley as a site. But then <laughs> as it turned out, and especially with the Curiosity mission, and now as it turns out with the uh, Mars 2020 rover mission, uh, these uh, sites where you just have streams and, and deposits in water and, and, and those types of things are also becoming really exciting places. And so we've actually, it's actually deepened our appreciation for Warner Valley as a field site because it not only has the hot springs of different flavors, by the way, the acidic ones and the more alkaline types, but also the main stream itself and other features, which really makes... Uh, Warner Valley, a, a sort of a, a real menu of, of options to make, you know, sort of relationships with Mars. Uh, so basically, uh, streams and, and deltas and lakes and stuff, as well as hot spring environments, these are sort of the leading candidates for places to explore on Mars. And the types of observations we make at Lassen indicate uh, that amongst the different types of hot springs or amongst the different types of deposits in water, which which ones are more promising, and you heard a little bit about that in the presentation tonight, but that is certainly relevant to our future site selection uh, for landing on Mars. Great, thank you, Dave. Uh, Chris Detail is pointing out intern.nasa.gov. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Fred Null Jr. Uh, has a question from his daughter. She asks, how did they hike that far? How did they stay outside overnight? What did they eat? Uh, yeah, <laughs> great question. That's, that's for a student to answer. <laughs> Who would like to handle that one? So first off, how did you possibly, as far as you hike? Well, I guess maybe it didn't really happen. Did we just like ride bikes? Somebody in this presentation talked about our field trip. <laughs> well, our hike was, <laughs> it wasn't that long. It was actually pretty nice. Um, it had just rained. Um, and so it was really um, cool and really nice to uh, take the hike. We actually, um, our group of mainstream, when we were walking back, I think it was the first day we like saw a deer in the field. So it was actually a pretty nice walk. Um, and so um, we walked the whole hike on our first day um, to all the field sites. And then on the second day, um, we um, just went to our own field sites uh, and also, uh, Dave, Nikki, and Mike also brought a lot of nice food and they did a really nice trip and Mr. Michael too. So had yes. you ever, um, oh, I was just going to ask, um, so for maybe some of the students that was their first time camping and I'm going to guess it was the first time for all of you hearing, um, an astrobiology presentation given at the campsite uh, with uh, Dave bringing out a, uh, a screen and a laptop and, and a way to project it. That was kind of fun. 
and hooking up to somebody's car battery for power. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Nikki, Mike, Dave, how, how many more questions uh, do you want to take? Uh, well, I think maybe we should do the... Our... What do you think, Mr. Michael? Yeah, maybe maybe one or, or two more. Um, okay. We've got uh, one so more left. Try to, uh, one more would be great. Great. Uh, before that, uh, Linda Yonke has a, a comment. Uh, the student presentations were wonderful. Uh, I don't know if you know that Zoom is overlaying your answers. Please make sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but the presentation came through clear and was great. So thank you, Linda. Uh, she also asked a question uh, to the students. Did you enjoy yourselves? Will any of you want to pursue a career in science? Great question. Yeah, I can speak from personal experience that I had a lot of fun in this class and I also feel like I learned. So it was a great incorporation of um, fun while also learning a lot um, about a topic of science that I'd never been exposed to in school. And I knew I always wanted to, at least I think I want to study science in the future. And this class only further inspired me to do so. I know. I I definitely, um, I definitely will be go going into the field of science and science and engineering. Um, my, I'm going to be attending Oregon State University in the fall, hopefully, and I will be uh, in the major of bioresource engineering. So definitely, it has impacted me a lot. And I believe Ashmi and Sahil are also going to be majoring in science next year as well. Um, if you guys are interested in sharing a little bit, am I remembering correctly? I could be misremembering there. Oh, no, you're correct. Um, I plan to major in biological sciences. So, and NASA definitely helped um, pave the path for me in my inspiration towards science. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I, I guess we are, have reached the end of questions. And so the last thing that we're going to do is a little bit anticlimactic, I realize, through a virtual thing, but we're going to try to award certificates of completion, kind of a diploma per se, to our interns for having wrapped up and, and did an, done an amazing job this year throughout the program. And so with that, I'm going to um, leave this to, to Mike Kubo, and he is going to be in charge of awarding these certificates. Thanks a lot, Mr. Michael. Um, so yeah, this is the part of the presentation where normally we would be standing up on stage handing out diplomas. Um, obviously, we can't do that tonight. Um, so we will uh, essentially just acknowledge the students. Uh, we'll show the certificate and acknowledge their participation. And unfortunately, we won't get to, uh, we hand it to them, shake their hands. But um, before I do that, since this is the part where we acknowledge uh, the, you know, the students and the mentors' participation, I very quickly want to acknowledge um, the, the help and assistance of some of the people who made this possible tonight. Um, first of all, Mike Torian, um, thanks so much for everything you've done for us. I know we could not have done this without you. Um, so thanks so much for your, uh, for your participation. And um, also a shout out to uh, Blue Marble Space Institute of Science for uh, hosting the live feed. We really appreciate that support as well. Um, and thanks, of course, to uh, you know, I'm trying, trying to uh, shout out the people that, that haven't gotten a shout out yet. Thanks especially to, uh, you know, support from headquarters um, for the, you know, the, the 12 years of support for this program. We, we greatly appreciate it. Um, so moving on from there, we'll go ahead and uh, hand hand out the awards or hand out the certificates. Um, we'll start with the first year students. Um, and you don't have to get up or say anything or do anything if you want to, you know, if you want to, you're welcome to, but no, no pressure. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Let's see if this works. It worked before. Is that looking good? Can everybody see the? Uh, yep. Cool yeah. Stuff. Mike, can you full screen that? I sure think I can. Let's try. Ooh, no, I can't. Hang on. Hell it's no. Hard. It's pretty good. Pretty big. I think uh, it's com Command L. I think is the shortcut. Command L. 
There we go. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate it. Oh, I don't know if that worked for us, though. <laughs> well, I don't think it could be any bigger. <laughs> okay. okay. Did it, we'll, we'll go with this. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, let me just make sure we're on the first. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, these are the uh, certificates, basically the, uh, you know, certificate of completion or diploma, if you will, that we hand to the students. Um, they are unsigned at this point because we couldn't coordinate that rapidly enough, but they will be signed. Well, they'll be sent out and signed to each student sent to their homes. Um, so I'm just gonna, gonna go ahead and read this out. Uh, the first one I'll read and then we'll read off the name. So um, you can see it says the Astrobiology Student Intern Program Award to, in this case, Fletcher Botke on today's date for your outstanding performance, commitment and dedication in support of the partnership between Lassen Volcanic National Park, NASA Ames Research Center and Red Bluff High School in the collection of scientific data through laboratory and field work. This work has increased our understanding of Lassen in ways that will enhance astrobiology, as well as the mission of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the National Park Service. So again, um, I'd like to present this one to Fletcher Botke. Fletcher, great job this year. Thank you so much. Next award goes to Dean Breckenridge. Dean, great, great work. Hey, Mike, sorry, I don't think the slides are changing, so maybe you have to hit escape and just scroll old-fashioned style. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thanks for the heads up. Okay. Did yeah, that it's working work? now. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, so Dean Breckenridge, like I said. Uh, next is Mary Cottier. Mary, nice work. Really good job this year. Thanks so much for being a part of the program. Uh, next is Lachlan Dean. Lachlan, nice job. Thanks so much. Great, great work this year, and thanks for being a part of the program. Uh, next up is Frasia Galos. Frasia, thanks. Thanks again for your participation. It was a lot of fun working with you. Next is Grace Gallagher. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, next up is Reese Gambetta. Thank you, Reese. Okay, and Alana Garrity. Nice job, Alana. Next up is Emma Hale. Thank you, Emma. Uh, next is Alyssa Harrison. Thanks a lot, Alyssa. Great work this year. Um, Braden Klein. Thank you, Braden. Tara Norton. Andrea Marquez. Samantha Paul. Oh, and that's and that's the end of the first year student. So I just want to say um, thanks to all the first year students. You guys all did a really wonderful job. And um, for those listening out there, I think Mr. Michael touched on this, but, um, you know, uh, just I, I, I have to hand it to you all for your um, your dedication to making this happen tonight. Um, this was, you know, a challenge that you overcame with with beauty and grace. <laughs> it was amazing. So uh, next up, second year students, uh, TC, Timothy Drury, TC, thank you so much for your participation these last two years. Um, you have really done a wonderful job uh, in the program and we really look forward to uh, seeing where you go in the future and, uh, and uh, hearing from you. Thank you so much, TC, nice work. Uh, Katie Lewisell, um, again, great job helping to lead the class. Thank you so much for your participation these last two years. It was a really excellent job we look forward to seeing and hearing from you in the future. Ashmi Kaur, um, again, great work. Um, I've never in my life had such an amazing uh, video per perform for us as you did, as you uh, helped engineer last year. That was really just, that was outstanding. And thanks so much for your participation in the program and your enthusiasm as well. And last is Sahil Singh. Sahil, great work again. Um, really appreciate your your effort um, and all of your all of your dedication to the program these two years. We really appreciate it. You did a great job. So we'll move on to uh, the mentors. The two mentors we would uh, like to uh, acknowledge tonight. I'm actually going to start with Tammy Boyd first. Um, I'll end with Mr. Michael. But um, uh, Tammy, thanks so much for your participation in the program. It's been Wonderful having you aboard. Um, and for those that don't know, this is Tammy's first year, I believe. I believe we saw her this last summer, but 
um, yeah, you know, uh, welcome aboard. Thank you so much for all of your contributions to the program. And we're really looking forward to working with you again next year. And last, of course, but not least, is Mr. Michael. Mr. Michael, thank you so much for your continued support of this program. Um, 12 years has gone by very fast. And um, this program has grown tremendously with your uh, assistance and leadership. So thank you so much. Thank you for always um, finding the best and the brightest that the school has. Um, we're never disappointed. And this year is no exception. So this has been really wonderful. So thank you so much um, for all of your hard work. We really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I think that pretty much summarizes the evening. Um, for those students who are still online with us, um, just wanna say there's, uh, I was gonna give a shout out also to another uh, effort that Blue Marble Space Institute of Science makes, which is uh, segnet.org. So it's essentially, um, an outreach program um, by early career astrobiologists. And it's a great way to kind of uh, stay involved in astrobiology um, sort of at a public informational level. So if you guys are, you know, if you've enjoyed what you've done here and want to stay involved uh, as you go to college, especially for second year students, but for, uh, for those first years as well, um, by all means, please. Oops et.org and it's a it's a great resource for you too uh oh it's a great resource for you to be able to access so anyway thank you again and i think that about wraps it up um mike did you have anything you wanted to follow up with let me just make a quick comment these will be signed before they're sent to the, before the students receive them but again the logistics of this uh, current situation have delayed that until after the presentation tonight but otherwise uh, yeah it's a great job well thank you all for for participating um, again i to reiterate what i said at the beginning we all really hope that everyone's safe and and sound and and taking care of yourselves and those around you. And um, we really appreciate the support that all of you have given this program. And, and we're hoping that for that support to continue. And uh, yeah, just, just thank you for everything. And um, that being said, if you have any questions that come up or whatever, feel free to reach out and we'll do the best we can to, uh, to answer them. And I think with that, I'm just, we're just going to end it. So have a good evening, everybody. And we will see you again next year, um, hopefully in person. And uh, thank you. Uh -huh.